Seven years later, it was the biggest computer company in the world, and I was uh, running a marketing group of about 40 people, uh, 27 years old, and that was the end of my science career forever. So, um, so that was kind of my entry into marketing. It wasn't planned, it was just something that uh, I found that I just really liked and uh, had to thank you for it. So that's how I started my career. Uh, in 2000, I left Dell.
assuming they may, they may or may not be ingredients for, for what you need. Um, and if they're not, then let's just open it up. And I'm, and I'm happy to talk and field questions and just answer whatever queries you have. Um, I will say, even though some of the concepts I'm going to talk about are incredibly basic, um, it's not the concepts that are, that are, that are hard. It's actually, um, it's doing them well is the hard part. Um, uh, so I, I'm going to share with you a couple of examples based on my experience and background. They may or may not be relevant for what your specific situation or problem is that you're working on. They may, they may have shaped it a little bit. Um, and if I'm not covering the right stuff, just tell me and we can move off with it and, uh, and move on to something else. Fair? Fair. Good. Um, and I, and I, I would really like this to be conversational. I know it's like 4.30 on a Friday, you're probably all exhausted. I'm a little bit exhausted. It's been a busy week, so um, I, it's going to be hard for you to stay awake if you don't like ask questions and, and talk. Um, so if, if there's something in your particular case or, or or thing that you're working on, and you just want to get your group's input on, my input on, just raise your hand and let's let's just talk about it. Well, I'm going to ask to like it. Yeah, before you get into anything else. Yeah. Um, you said you were doing that at the start of the two years, like when you went to some levels of that first issue, and then you got to the issue, and then you issue No, I had it long since passed. Uh, yeah. 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 yeah, they were very happy. At that time, Direct selling is a very, very full idea. And, uh, and Dell just, Dell, Dell destroyed the computers. They just they suck the profitability and all the fun out of our industries. Today, like, we barely stay alive in, in the hardware industry. It was just destroyed. It was fun when you were there. Like, you're all in hell. Um, okay, yeah. So it's one best for the industry. Or what would it, uh, we ended up selling um, the company, which really was a bunch of a, a bunch of code, um, to a building company out of, out of the UK for basically enough to keep the developers uh, employed for a while. Um, so, yeah, I wish I was in the same time. Yeah, we ended up we ended up selling it for basically. Okay, so. Um, so for guys like me, um, I live in a bunch of different worlds from, from, from broader business planning, what, what is our company going to be five years from now, um, how are we going to position ourselves in the marketplace, how are we going to differentiate, um, what are our competitor strengths and weaknesses, how are we going to grow, how are we going to make money, um, through to, hey, I've got some really neat, really neat product developments in my business and I need to make sure that are aware of it, or whoever my customer is aware of it, so I can build some interest and drive some uh, drive some sales. Um, I got to think about you know. Uh, anyways, I'll, I'll get into that a little bit. So, but there's basically three components for a guy like me that, that I think about on a daily basis, or sometimes a, a yearly basis, depending on what it is. And uh, it's, it's basically these three ingredients, which is uh, what I title our brand strategy. And brand strategy is, is very encompassing. So I know we're here to talk about marketing, um, but it's generally the marketing organization inside companies that help companies figure out what their overarching brand strategy is. Brand strategy is done well, it should influence everything. It should influence the products, it should influence how people, how employees behave, it should influence your customer service strategy, and obviously it influences your marketing and communication strategy. So I thought I'd start there. Um, there's a couple of ingredients in um, in, in what the window of brand strategy. I'm gonna I'm gonna cover it very superficially, um, but I think it's a good starting point because I know you need to think about uh, as part of your projects the marketing component. But if you haven't thought about the brand strategy apart from listening, then you're actually missing most important things. Um, I'll talk about a couple things to think about in your product strategy, and these things really depend on what you're doing. You're a hardware company to a service company, you're going to do completely different things. Um, some, of the, some of the principles should, should, should still make sense. And I thought we could spend a little bit of time on communication strategy. So if at the end of the day, you've got a new thing that you've got to go and you make sure people know what exists so that they go buy it, um, we can talk about some of those things. I don't have a ton of detail there because um, the options are infinite. It really depends on a whole bunch of criteria specifically related to your problem or your So um, those are the ingredients I, I, I decided to talk about. If there's something else 
you guys want to talk about. I am uh, more than open to digging, digging into other areas, but I have the, uh, I guess I have the uh, faculties to answer the questions. So, uh, I'm sure you guys have all heard of us. Well, again, I apologize. A lot of these concepts are really basic, but the fast thing is that big complete you need to actually do these things. Um, uh, before you start down the path of, of a brand strategy for your company, this is a really important exercise because it can it can help steer and guide you in terms of how you're going to position yourself in the We're at a point in time where there are so many freaking companies and so many freaking products that at the end of the day, you're, you're searching for that little grain of how you're going to be different than everybody else. How are you going to be better than all those other players that are already in that space and being in there for a long time? It's very rare that there's some brand new novel concept that hasn't been created already that it doesn't really matter what it is because there's no competition. Right? That just doesn't exist anymore. So, um, this is a really important exercise. So, um, the tricky part with this is sometimes they blur and you get a little bit confused by it. Like, that strength sounds like an opportunity and that threat sounds like a, sounds like a weakness. But uh, we don't need to dig into this unless somebody in the room would like to do this for their specific example. I'm happy to help you work through it in a specific case. But um, this is a really important exercise. If you can spend some time and think about this and really fill in these blocks, if you go through the next steps of ingredients, this will be a really important guide as basic as it, as it seems. Any questions about this? But I would highly encourage you. I, the, the problems that you're working on, are they completely fictional or are they based in reality? They're all real. So, so if, if, you're, if you're thinking about a specific new product or something, you, you are already thinking about, okay, these are the real players that are already in this perfect. Do this exercise if you haven't already, but don't rush through it. are shy. You guys are shy. Um, okay. So, we've done a SWAT. It's really well thought through. Now you're going to start thinking about your brand strategy. If you haven't already thought about your brand strategy, um, this is a really important part. It, I, I was amazed. I came into Sportsnet. This is a business that's been in I've been around for like 20 years. But granted, we're going we're gonna to completely revitalize it and, and turn it into something new, but there was no brand strategy. I went and I said, so who's, who's the target audience for this company? What do you mean? What do you, what do you mean, what's the target audience? Okay, what, what, what does Sportsnet stand for? Like, why should people watch Sportsnet? Well, we, we carry sports. Okay, okay, well, why are you different than, t how are we gonna be TSN? How are we different than TSN? I, I don't know, I, like, we just, we're gonna have better sports on our, on our network than they're gonna have. I said, okay. So, so they're a big, Sportsnet's a half a billion dollar company. Half a billion dollars, that's, that's not gigantic, but it's not that small. They haven't done this work yet. So everybody's saying, we're gonna be the biggest sports company in five years, but if you, don't, if you can't do this stuff, then the whole company's just off doing all kinds of different stuff. You're not rowing in the same direction. You're not, your product strategy isn't aligning with your marketing strategy. Your, your investment strategy in the properties isn't lining up with anything. Everybody's just off doing whatever they think is cool and interesting. So, um, this is an important ingredient because if you can get this tight, then as your company goes to market, everybody understands what to do. Without it, uh, it's it's a it's a messy free for all. And this is and I, I, I honestly believe that companies who do not have a tight brand strategy have a really hard time succeeding, especially in a really competitive marketplace. You've got to be so tight on your execution across every part of the business, or it falls down. So, 
These are four basic ingredients. I, 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 I could have brought a brand pyramid that has 17 layers, but I actually, I hate those things. I, when I went into Rogers and I said, can I see your brand pyramid? And it was like, it was literally like 18 layers. I was like, wow, how, how does somebody in customer service know what to do? Like, cause it's just, it's so complicated. Um, I like to live in a very simple brand strategy land. So if I go to somebody in the sales force, if I go to somebody in a product development team, if I go to somebody in HR, they, they, can, they can easily explain what the brand is. Um, and that's really important. So th these are the four ingredients. And I, I, again, I know this is kindergarten, but it's, it's really important stuff. One, who's your target audience? You have to identify that right out of the gate. And again, go back to your SWOT for all of these things. Understand your competition, where you're strong, where they're strong, where you're weak, where they're weak, where you can grow, where they can grow where they're exposed to risk, where you're exposed to risk. Identify your target audience. Who is it? And there's generally two pieces to that formula. Um, there's, there's psychographics and there's demographics. And the demographics are really simple. It's, are they male? Are they female? How old are they? What, what, what um, ethnic background do they come from? Where do they live? Are they urban? Um, basic fundamentals about uh, of, uh, of um, demographic. Define it as tightly as you can. Some companies will be everybody. There's very few companies that their products appeal to the entire universe. Um, a company like Google, okay, they have, a very, they have a very broad target. It's the entire world, right? Um, if you are a company like Sportsnet, um, our demographic is men, not only men, but in terms of our brand strategy, our target is men because it represents about 80% of, our, of, our, of the people who consume sports in, in, in Canada. Um, it's men. Um, they're generally, for our business and speci specifically, lots of people watch sports, but for our brand, it's a little bit older. So it's about 35 to 65 years old, generally is who our target is. Um, it's a real mix of urban and rural. Um, spread across the country, um, mostly English speaking. That would be a, that would be a description of my company's um, demographic profile of our target. Um, psychographic is w what do they think? So what are some characteristics about what that target thinks? Um, so an example is um, in my company we've built um, psychographic clusters. So I've taken all the people in Canada that have, that have categorized themselves as a fan of sport in some form or another. It represents about 70% uh, of the Canadian population. Um, and I have built six different clusters. I won't ex explain them all to you or bore you with them. There are, there are two in particular that we focus in on and they're psychographically based. Um, there's one that we have given the internal title of super sport fan, okay? It's not that creative, but that's what we call it. Um, and the psychographic profile of these people are, they love every single sport, every single team inside those sports. They love players, they put money on games, they love to bet. Um, they follow and track sports across every conceivable device and platform known to man, from television to tablets to apps, to listening into radio shows, to consuming Sports Illustrated magazine. Um, they love it. That's one cluster. They are generally very urban, they're generally a little bit uh, younger of that 35 to 65 range. Um, so that is my primary target for Sportsnet. Super sports fans within that demographic range. My next best target is what I call super sports fan light. Again, not that creative. Um, these are internal things, it's, it's, it helps people understand. Um, and they are basically the same as that first target except they're very home team based. So they're not as broad in terms of loving every team in every sport. They love Toronto Maple Leafs and they love Raptors and they love the Argonauts and they love the Blue Jays, um, but they have very similar characteristics. They're also a little bit older. So we find as people tend to get older in life, they tend to root more for the home team versus when they're uh, 20 years old and in university, much more diverse in terms of your following, if sports are passion. So that's an example of a very tight or fairly tight definition of your target. Now, we didn't just pulled that out of the air, we, we, we arrived on that target based on that SWOT analysis. We understood who are our competitors, 
who is interested in sports, who are our competitors, where are they playing, where are they weak, where do we have opportunity, where does our competitor have a potential threat, and we zeroed in on that specific target. There was, there was a bunch of other factors which um, fed into that, which we have to go through this a bit more to help understand it, but that is a, a key ingredient. Um, closely related to that is a target insight. So once you've defined that really tight definition of who that target is, you need to understand what they care about, what they fear, um, and this is specifically in relation to, if you can, your product. The industry that you're, that you're, that you're in and the product that you're going to sell, how does that target? What problem could it solve in their life? That's what I mean by target insight. Um, uh, actually, I've got an example on the next slide from, from Rogers, uh, which I'll go through in a sec. Um, the, next the next ingredient is what we call um, the brand pillars. And the brand pillars are very simply, um, what are the fundamental functional components of your company that will allow you to win at the end of the day? Um, brand. Um, uh, again, I'm going to go through an example in a second. And, uh, and then the last thing is the brand promise. Now this is a fluffy statement generally that kind of encapsulates all those things that if it's really tight and you were to say, and you, and you were to ask somebody in customer service, what, what is our brand? What, what, is our, what is our point of being? They would rhyme off that line. And it would quickly encompass your target, your brand pillars, and that insight all in one nice tight statement. So here, here's an example of what it is for, uh, or what it was, it's, it's evolved. That's why I'm not afraid to talk to you about this because this is not confidential anymore because it, it isn't this anymore, it's changed. But when I was running advertising for Rogers Wireless, this was basically the brand, the brand story for Rogers Wireless. Um, the target um, demographically was fairly narrowly defined as youth, 14 to 24 years old. That's who Rogers at, at the time um, really wanted to, to focus its efforts on and to win market share in. Um, the goal was to have at least 50% market share against that target. 50% market share in the wireless category is enormous. Um, with a sweet spot inside that, which was called trans youth, so 18 to 21. So if Rogers could dominate the marketplace amongst 18 to 21 year olds, um, it was a recipe for success for the business. Um, um, I'm going to explain some of the insights around it as I get a little deeper. Um, so here are a couple of insights. So in the category of wireless, relative to that target, here are some insights that we pulled out of this group. Um, and these things aren't obvious. These, some of these things are just, and they should be, just general human truths. Um, one was, and if, you can laugh at these things if you want, because a lot of you are in this demographic. You may call bullshit on it, but... Maybe you're different now than what youth were 10 years ago. Um, you strive to create meaningful relationships with their peers and to be seen as social leaders within their circle of friends. This was a, this was a, a human truth that we gleaned out, a whole bunch of old people sitting around a boardroom who don't understand anything about an 18-year-old girl um, had to figure out what, what motivates them, what do they care about. This is one of the biggest things that came back. Um, and technology, fashion, music, and sports are kind of some of the key ingredients in that social in that social stew of how they how they enable that first thing to happen. So as uh, as people are desperately trying to you know get close to other people, build those relationships with friends, those are some of the ingredients in terms of of, of, of some of the enablers. So we said, okay, that's our target. Those are the insights around them. So. What are, our, what are our brand pillars? These are, how are we going to differentiate? What are we going to be known for in the marketplace? Um, there's, there's a million different things we could talk about, but what are the key things that we want to distill every communication down to so that we become known for those things? That over time, if we walked up to 100 youth on the street and we said, what is Rogers all about? Ideally, they would replay these two things back. They got the coolest phones and they got the best network. Because through other forms of research, we determined that those two things in relation to those insights were the most important. So those were the brand pillars. And, and then the brand promise, which wrapped it all up, was the innovative leader empowers youth to create really meaningful relationships, meaningful connections with friends. That was the brand promise. That was the idea that was instilled across the company. So the power of this was, 
If you were in the product development team at Rogers Wireless and you came up with an idea and it didn't deliver on having the latest and coolest phones of the best network, it didn't happen. It might have been a really great idea, but we said, no, you don't get to do that. We want ideas that do those two things and that's it. Because we know if we differentiate around those things and hit those things out of the park, we will dominate the industry against that target. And to be perfectly honest, for a, for a span of about seven years, Rogers hit it out of the ballpark. They delivered against that target. Those two promises actually did it, um, marketed it well, um, and actually shifted perception. And the perception was real. It did have the best network. It did have the coolest phones. So it, it, I'm going to go back to that SWAT for an example. Going back to strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Rogers a long time ago made this incredible Ted, Ted Rogers genius said, you know what, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to build a GSM technology network, wireless network. No other company in Canada had done it. Companies in the US hadn't done it. He's like, I'm going to do it because he saw ahead that that's the way the world was going. So he built a GSM network. The, the other Canadian telcos didn't, didn't go along with it. Um, leapfrog forward about six or seven years, GSM is now the dominant network technology around the world. Rogers is still the only carrier in Canada that has a GSM network. So the result of that is, is all the major handset manufacturers, Motorola, Nokia, uh, Samsung, you name it, they were spending all their R&D money developing handsets for GSM. And then if they had time and energy, they would also make sure that they built out variants to support that old other technology called CDMA, which is what TELUS and Bell and all the other guys want. So the big opportunity for Rogers was we were going to have, because of the nature of the network we'd chosen by our founder seven years earlier, we were going to have way better friggin' handsets than all the other guys because that's what was being developed globally. Okay, that was an opportunity and it was a major threat for our competitors. So that was a part of the ingredients in terms of what determined that as a brand pillar. And we knew we could deliver on it. It wasn't just going to be marketing puffery. We knew we didn't have to buy our way there. It was just going to happen. And we didn't have to do anything to get it. Um, the most reliable network, uh, you probably, I don't know if you would remember some of these ad campaigns. You know, the two guys, is a cool guy and a loser. I created that campaign. It started about, uh, I think, about six years ago with two guys getting into an elevator. Um, that, what's that? No, it's not that. That's di that's different. <laughs> I don't remember that one. Yeah, they're still using it. It's really long in the tooth now. They need to stop using it, but uh, it worked really well for a while. And the proof points around it were uh, Rogers had fewer drop calls and it had a clearer reception. Those were real facts. They weren't fake. They weren't made up. They weren't marketing puffery. They were true facts. They were scientifically researched and proven and actually in the court of law, which we fought a lot of times in around it, um, we consistently won because it was true. So we told people that. And, and we also knew that they cared about it. We knew it was meaningfully relevant and it was a meaningful differentiator. So, um, but it focused the whole company on those two things. Coolest handsets, best network, everything lined up against it. So um, again, very superficial ingredients, but really important ingredients because if you can do these things really well, and they're real, and it's not marketing puffery, and everybody in the organization lines up against it because you've tightly defined it against that brand strategy, um, it's, a, it's an ingredient for success. It doesn't mean you're going to be successful because at the end of the day, your product might just be terrible. But if you have a good product, and you do these things properly, and you get the, everybody in the organization rolling in the same direction, um, it's, 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 it's a great ingredient. Thank you. All right. Any questions on that? Does it make sense? I know it's basic, and like I said, the concepts are basic, but actually getting, getting what's behind it correct and doing the right thinking to make sure it's actually really, it's solidly built, that's the hard part. That's the hard part. So spend some time on those things. Think about your problem. Do that SWOT analysis. Get it right, and then start to build out that stuff. And, and all of a sudden, what comes together is, your business plan starts taking shape. This is, not, this is not 101 on how to build a business plan, but these are the ingredients to help make sure that the choices you're making in your business plan are actually legit. 
Sorry, you have a question back there, yeah. 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 Yep. Yep. Well, those are the choices, right? That, that that's why there's there's no right or wrong. You got to just make choices, and you got and so. You may decide that you're going to compete head to head. I'm going to go after that exact same consumer. My target may be identical. That's not necessarily a bad decision. But then you've got to go into, well, why are they going to choose your product? So now you've got to differentiate around some other things. You have choices around how you differentiate. You can differentiate around who you're going to go after in the marketplace. Or you may decide, no, I'm going to go after the exact same people because those are the only people that actually buy that kind of product. So I, I, I have to go after the same target. So how else, what is the other reason why they're going to come to me? How else am I going to differentiate? And you can, again, you can choose that at a whole bunch of different levels and we're going to go through some of those. You can do it on price. You can do it on image, purely on image. You can do it on really functional differences in terms of how your product works than how the other guys works. Maybe it just offers a slightly different set of features that may be more compelling to that same target than the other guy's features. Um, that's where you have to start to make some of those decisions. So it's not this, you don't always have to say, oh my God, there's already somebody in that space against that target, I need to find another target. Um, I mean, a good example of that is, so Rogers did this for a while and um, was having a lot of success. So a competitor said, well, I gotta get in the mix. They're having too much fun all alone there. So Bell said, I'm gonna create a separate brand called Virgin. And I'm gonna launch Virgin in the marketplace. And I'm going to go solely after trans youth. I'm going to go after that 18 to 21, except I'm going to do it better than Rogers. I'm going to make it sexier. I'm going to make it edgier. I'm going to provide other features around my product. They got this reliable network thing and cool phones, but I'm going to give them rewards to get into movies and to buy clothes because they did research and found out the passion points are the same. They got the same answers back, but they differentiated their product in a different way. So their, their proposition to that same target was a little bit different. And it worked. It worked, and they started to, sh to steal share away from Rogers. Does that answer the question? Ish? Okay. Yeah. It's a great question. It's a great question. I actually, I find it's a fascinating answer. At least I think it's fascinating. So, um, so population in Canada X, fourteen to twenty-four is a very narrow sliver, right? Big company. They got to sell a lot of phones. Um, just selling to that narrow target would not be enough to to satisfy the needs of the business in terms of its revenue and growth and, and EBITDA objectives. So, but why do we pick that target? Because it's very narrow. It sounds very narrow. And what research told us, and it was right, is that by targeting trans youth, we actually appeal to a very broad section of the population because younger people aspire to be trans youth. 14, 13, and more recently 12, 11 year olds now have cell phones. They, they aspire to be free 18, 18 19 year olds. They're out at university, they're partying, they have cars, they have girlfriends. They just, they can't wait to be those people. So, um, as we, and this is, this is part of the manipulation of marketing, that's a terrible word, but um, as we show our products in the hands of that aspirational target, 14 year olds say, well, I, I should get that phone too because I'm gonna be like that guy. So targeting trans youth actually allowed us to bring in a younger population at the same time. And then the other piece of magic was young adults aspire to be younger. So people who are in their late 20s and are all of a sudden burdened by things like mortgages and car payments and, and diapers and responsibility and paying bills they just want to go back to when it was they were 22 years old and they were partying and, and away at university and that was an aspirational time and they just want to go back there. Um, 
So, um, so, you know, it, it, so it drew them in too. So when we portrayed these devices with this trans youth demographic, 28-year-old said, I want that phone too because I want to I want to I want to be I want to be like that guy because I remember it was great and I, I, I want to relive that so um, by, by zeroing in on trans youth we actually appealed to um, an age range from about 13 years old up into early 30s um, so that strategy actually had fairly broad halo in terms of market share and then we had to do other things we had to target older sections of the populations with different products and separate sets of activities, um, which, I won't, which I won't go into right now to make sure that the business could be at the scale it needed to be, but, um, but it's a good question. It was, it, was a, it was a really interesting example of where uh, you can be very specific, but you can actually have broader appeal, um, even though it appears that you're being very specific. So any other questions around brand strategy? There are, there are other nuances to it and other, and other layers that you can dig into, but if, I think for your purposes, if you can, if you can solve against those, those, at least those three basic ones of, of target um, your brand pillars and that consumer insight, um, you're 95% you're of the way there in terms of helping shape the decisions and helping it. As you go and pitch, you've got to explain some of these things. You've got to help un people understand why you've made the decisions that you're making, and it should all be tightly interconnected um, because if it's not people uh, will quickly identify that and expose it and start poking at weaknesses but if you've done those things really well um, you should be bulletproof so I just thought I'd go through some of the I thought I'd dig into product strategy now so I go back to my days of okay I'm the product manager at Dell and my job is to um, make sure I've got the right product mix, set the right prices, what's my promotional strategy, um, how am I distributing my products in the marketplace, how am I gonna make margin, what kind of margin do I wanna make, um, those kinds of things. I thought I'd just, I'd throw up, these, these ones I have very little detail on, so I thought I would just kinda open them up as kinda concepts, and if you guys wanna pick at it a little more, get any advice or, or ask questions, feel free. So, one of the key ingredients to a product strategy is price. What is my price? And kind of like those other things, price is a very basic um, concept. Oh, I've, I've, I've upset some people. Um, how you, bye guys. How you price your product is, um, is, is an incredibly strategic decision um, because uh, there's, there's so much choice. How do you decide how I'm gonna price? Um, and again, it goes back to, it goes back to um, a whole bunch of things. Who are my competitors? How are they pricing? Um, what kind of margin do I need to create inside my business? There's so many pressures on price um, to grow your business. And I, and, I, and I put it on two dimensions. These are obvious two ends of the spectrum. Um, and I'll use technology because I'm so close to it and so it's easy for me. But there's, there's other examples we can use. So, um, let's let's use um, let's use the computer industry as an example because I spent so much time there. Who who would be at the top end of that on the on the premium side? You all have it. I see them all over the place. It's Apple. Apple, right? Apple is the premium brand in the marketplace. Um, they're the highest priced product. Apple is pretty much never ever ever on sale. Yeah, occasionally retailers will put it on sale. But Apple as a brand is never on sale, and that and actually helps fuel the premium position of the product. It's kind of one of the spectrum. Who would be on the low level? From, you know, Acer. Acer. Acer is a great example. They would be kind of one of the lower priced brands. I mean, you could even go lower, and there's like no name white label guys. But from a brand name perspective, yeah, they would be on the low end. Highly promotional. They compete on price. That is their differentiator. I'm just using that as a basic example of the range of spectrum. You have to decide. Where in that continuum you're, you're going to play? It gets way more confusing when you go into service products, but for hard products, um, is anybody here, in terms of your, your proposition, is anybody doing service-related things? You're probably doing a lot of that, actually, no? Is it all hard product things? What are you doing it on, then? <laughs> Who would be service-based? Okay. Who would be doing like a hard product? Okay, if it's not one of those two things, I need another example of what it might be then. Okay, so that's a service. I would call that a service. 
Who's, who's got a product? Who's got a hard good? What's, what, what's that? That's okay. That's okay. It sounds like there's a lot of blend. Who is a, who is a hard product, like an exclusively hard product? Like who's making something, a thing? Nobody wants to make things anymore. Instruction. So what, give me an example. So specialized construction assembly. So is that is that a service? It's a hard product. For instance, if you have a specialized kind of window, then it's a product. So making that window would be considered a hard product. Okay, so, so your company would make that window? It's any kind of specialized assembly. Any kind of specialized assembly. Okay. Um, so that's a, that's a, in that, in that, so you're, you're, and the customer there is, is Commercial customers, not the consumer, I'm guessing? It's business customer. Okay, so yeah, price there is very tricky. Um, I, I, I don't know what else to say in this specific area um, without, without digging into specific examples. I can go through my examples of uh, in my world, but... Um, yep. You're going to make your own perfume, okay. That's a hard product. Yep. So have you decided how you're going to price it? Um, I mean, perfume brands, for the most part, all want to live up at the top, right? I mean, you, you, don't, you never see a perfume brand on sale, really, unless it's probably a retailer. It's all, that's all image, and you want to be as premium as you possibly can, right? Because um, in a luxury good category of hard product, um, you have that magical mix of perception of high price means high quality, um, and that's where it's a very. I, I find it. A, I find luxury a fascinating industry because it's um, how you price luxury has so again so many factors. And price actually is a component. As, well, it is in every industry, but price not every industry, but in most hard good industries, it can be such a huge component of what actually your brand is and what your brand stands for. Um, so, anyways, just it's. Uh, one of your ingredients, it may or may not make sense depending on what your particular, your case or situation is, but you should have a handle on what is the pricing strategy for your product? How does it differ from your competitors? How is it going to drive the success of your business? How are you using price as a strategic ingredient in the success of the business? Um, if you haven't thought through it, you should, because if you don't have a tight pricing strategy, um, you're missing a huge ingredient in the overall mix of, of, of the business plan. Yeah. I think, uh, for example, most of the stuff that we create, they're very new. So it's like different technology. How would we understand how to value the price? If it's something we don't even know if it's in a luxury, if it's anywhere. So that's something we have to challenge. Yeah, it's tricky. It, it's tricky if, it's a, if, you're, if you're offering something that is, uh, especially in the, in the world of service products where, um, you're, you're, you're probably doing something that could be very unique. Um, it's very, very standalone and different. Um, there's, there's so many variables you have to consider. Uh, I, 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 spent, I spent a year doing some consulting, and this is where I still feel a little bit ashamed, but it was, it, I, it was just, it was, it was lucrative enough that I, I got over it. So. Um, I went and worked for IBM for a year because they desperately wanted to understand how Dell did Dell things. Um, so, so I, I, so I had to price myself, um, and you know, not a lot of scale when you're a, you're a one man business. But that, I had those same questions, like, how do I charge these people? And, and generally, it came down to the decisions I made were really uh, less based on competitive factors, and it was more based on um, how much money did I feel like I needed to make? And, and, I, and I made the decision on how to price myself based on how much was my time worth, how much did I feel like uh, at, at, by the end of a year I should have been able to collect. Um, so in a lot of service-based industries where it's heavy, heavy people cost um, and, and it's high differentiation, very specialized, um, I guess you almost have to think more about it in terms of um, at the end of the day, how much money are you trying to make, and 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 have a bit of a grasp on um, 
on how much how much is your customer willing to spend? I know it's a terrible answer, but it's it's so different from case to case to case. Yeah. Yeah, I think that I totally valid. Totally valid. Yeah. I mean, you could you could say, look, uh, my services are going to generate this much value in your business. I should get a I should get a component of that. I should get a I should maybe be able to I should be able to be able to keep. But you look at a lawyer, for example, right? They, that's the exact same equation. They're going to go sue somebody on your behalf and make you X amount of dollars. They're going to keep probably 50%, maybe a bad example. In a, in a, in a consulting service-based industry, maybe you keep you know, 15 to 20% of that, of that revenue that you're going, to, you're going to help your client create. And that's, that's good value exchange at the end of the day. Yeah, totally. Yeah. 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 So, so part of the decision on that target, and again, like I said, there's there's so many ingredients that go into choosing the target. Part of it's competitive and other things, but one of it was back to this equation. So the business, the business decided that it wanted to play up in the premium brand land. It wanted to charge a premium relative to its competitors because the business wanted to earn a profit margin of a certain percentage. In, in, in Roger's case, um, there, there's, there's no industries like this left in the world. where it, It's operating up in the 40% margin range on, on a fairly expensive service. Um, so part of it was, well, how do, how do we maintain that profit margin of 40%? How do we stay up in that range? The only way to do that is to charge a certain amount per month per subscriber. How am I going to get that much money per subscriber? I've got to, I've got to target segments of the population with a value proposition that they're willing to, to pay that much. Part of the decision around that target was is they're actually, that, that trans youth and youth target is actually willing to pay more for wireless services than mostly any other segment in the marketplace. Trans youth spend more per month, with the exception of business customers, spend more per month on their wireless bill than anybody else. They spend way more than teenagers. They spend way more than young adults who are burdened by mortgages and diapers and, and things. And they have to think about costs very heavily. Youth spend freely on wireless. Their average monthly cell phone bills are higher than anybody else. So that was another reason why that target was picked. Like I said, these are all ingredients that all work together. Um, the decision was they, need the, they wanted to be a premium brand. They needed to be a premium brand to drive the profit levels that the business needed so that part, part of the target decision was to focus in on that area of the market that, would, that actually spends the most on a monthly basis on cell phones. Um, I'm trying to think of another pricing example. Um, I, mean, I, I could use the example of uh, uh, Sportsnet World, which is one of the channels in the Sportsnet portfolio. It's, it's a service. It's, Anybody subscribe to Sportsnet World? You all better. Anybody a soccer fan? Look at me, I'm just unabashedly pitching my company's product. It's terrible. It's $18 a month for a TV channel. Can you imagine paying $18 a month for a TV channel? You guys probably can't even contemplate even paying for TV. Um, it's all the internet, yeah. How do you calculate that?
can't just say that there's like a five million people who watch the like, love doctors or five million people who turn the technology behind the For sure. You have to know like how many percent of the five million people can be your problem. That's right. So how do you actually like when you're starting your business, how do you respond to that? It's so hard when you're starting. Like it's so hard because it's all guesswork, right? You're, you're going to have to make assumptions. You're going to have to make some guesses. You have no other choice. It's, it's, it's much easier in a business like Rogers, as an example, that's been operating for a while. And then you can start to reshape things a little bit as you, as you understand trends in the business. When you're starting out, um, I, have, I don't have a lot of advice to give. I mean, you, you, again, you go back to some of these ingredients around... Um, understanding the industry, understanding your competitors, understanding what exists already and using that as a bit of a guide. If it is a novel product that has never existed before, you're just going to have to make some crazy wild guesses. You have nothing else to go on. All those, all those things that you talked about are ingredients in the math equation. Yeah, they're all important. How many, how many potential people are there out there that would want to buy my service? What percentage of that population do I think is going to buy my product? What price am I going to set relative to my costs, so I'm going to drop out of the bottom with a certain, a, a certain um, income at the end. You have, to, you have to model that all out and build those things out. There's no, there's no magic answer to the question, though, especially if it's a brand new business. My, my best advice is if you're, if you're emerging into a category that has competitors, understand their business a little bit. Understand um, how, um, how much share do they have within a specific target? How are they pricing it? And it can maybe help shape some of those things for you, but otherwise, I, I don't know how to answer the question. You're, you just got you got to take some wild guesses at. I mean, uh, in in my example of Sportsnet, we launched a new channel. It's called Sportsnet World. Now, granted, we had a we had a bit of an advantage in that we took over an existing channel that had a different brand. Um, it was called Satanta. We took over that channel, and it, it is a it is a it's a service product. It's something you, but it's kind of like a hard product. You pay monthly for this television service, eighteen bucks a month, just for one channel. It has a lot of international soccer, rugby, cricket. So we said, how 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 big can we grow this thing? Like, what's the potential? What should we price it at? What what's the what's the potential customer opportunity? So we we went out and tried to understand. Okay, what, what's the universe of the people out there? that have an interest in, in those sports, first and foremost. So, like I said, 70% of the population in Canada is a sports fan. Okay, what percentage of those watch international soccer, rugby, and cricket? Okay, that, that, that brought it way down to like this little tiny wedge of like 5% of the population. Okay, now I'm, now I'm dealing with a certain subset of the population. How many of those do I think would actually pay $18 a month for a television service against that? Then it went way down. And we ended up with a bit of math that said the absolute best we think we could grow that product to is about a quarter of a million people. That's the biggest it will ever become based on the content strategy that we've decided to put on that channel. Maximum opportunity is 250000 That's it. That's, that's the ceiling. Okay, so that, that was one parameter that helped us. Uh, we, we, we took over a channel that had uh, about 50,000 customers on it already. Great, good starting point. We knew we had a, a ceiling of 200,000. Then, then we got into, okay, well, well how are we going to grow this thing to 250? That's what we think the, 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 the opportunity is in terms of customer size. And that's where you got to do a little bit of price elasticity, and you can do that with guesswork, or you can do it with real work. So one of the things we did is we, we, we have the benefit of, of, of different distribution through a bunch of different affiliate partners across the country. So Bell carries my channel. Shaw, Telus, Rogers, Eastlink, Kojiko, got all these carriers. Why don't I go and see what different pricing options drive different kinds of ac activity and volume? And let's see if we can get some learning I know this isn't helping you because you've got to come out with a pitch, but for me it was, I could actually play around in the marketplace and I could experiment and I could try different pricing levels and see what kind of penetration rates I could achieve at different price levels. So it's, it's some basic price elasticity modeling. Um, we found that it didn't matter how low we brought the price, we actually couldn't drive penetration up. If you were just a hardcore fan, you would pay the money. And, and, and we found once you got over about $25 to $30, then you'd start to see fall off. But in around the $20 range is kind of the magic number. And if I charged less, I, I couldn't actually drive higher penetration. And it actually ended up, at the end of the day, resetting the actual maximum size of the opportunity. We now believe the maximum opportunity for that channel is 150,000 people. And that's it. 
Today we're at about 120,000, so we've almost reached what we think is the capacity of what that channel will ever drive. So then the decision starts to become, okay, well, are we satisfied with that or do we actually want to put different content on there to start to grow the opportunity? So I know I'm not perfectly answering your question, but I, I think at the end of the day, if you have a novel product, first time ever in the marketplace, um, you have to just make some wild assumptions. Um, in order for us, so the key, the key with those tests is you have to be able to measure them, right? So um, we had to do it against an entire, an entire um, uh, uh, carrier base. So um, we tended to pick the smaller ones because it was less risk. So we would go to like an Eastlink where their subscriber base is a couple hundred thousand people and um, versus like doing it with a Shaw where they've got millions of subscribers and if I get it wrong, it actually costs me some real money. Um, so uh, it, it just, we, we tended to focus on the smaller ones, but the point being is that you've got to make sure when you do price elasticity tests like that, that you can actually get a good measurement. Yeah. Okay, um, any other questions? Oh, sorry, you're, you're working that. Um, so another ingredient, and I, and I feel like I've picked this badly. I come from a hardcore world, or a hard product world. So I tend to think in hard product land and I, I have not spent that much of my career in a service business where it sounds like you guys are all deciding to play or a lot of you are deciding to play. But, um, one of, but this, this concept still, I think, still has applicability. Um, and it's your distribution strategy. How are you going to sell your product? Who's going to sell it? Um, in a hard product example, you've got you know, you can sell direct to your consumer. You can do that. Um, you can open up your own stores. You can sell direct over the internet. You can use the phone. Um, are you going to have a reseller model? Are you going to have a partner model? Are you going to have other people sell your products for you? Um, you know, think of like a, think of the, the food industry. Very few food manufacturers sell their products directly. They use grocery stores and grocery chains. And again, basic concepts. But you have to make these decisions. How am I going to distribute my product? Um, and, and, and some of these decisions are, are, are based on um, how fast do I want to be able to scale? How much money do I want to make? As soon as I bring in partners, now I have to erode some of my profit margin. If I do it all myself, I get to keep it all, but maybe I don't have the scale to grow as fast as I want. So these are, again, things you have to decide. Am I doing it myself? Am I using partners to do it? In a service industry, um, what I find the biggest question is always scale. How do I scale? Scale is easy with hard products. Well, it's not easy with hard products, but it, it's, you, can, you, can, you can find your way to scale simply by optimizing distribution models. When your service industry, scale, again, is usually dependent on people. It's highly people-based, um, and your scale is generally defined by the amount of people that you bring in because you're monetizing the people that are involved in the business, generally in a service industry. Unless, unless your service is kind of some kind of hybrid where at the end of the day it is actually a product that you're selling. So the question becomes in, in a service industry is how do you scale up? How do you grow? Um, if you're a consultancy type industry, um, um, how do you take that from a, a $1 million business? If your objective at the end of the day is you want to be a $100 million business, how do you go from a million to a hundred? if it's all based on the fact that the only thing that you're monetizing in your business is, your, is the people that are actually spending time with clients or whatever else. So um, these are, again, just another ingredient in the mix that you have to be thinking about as you're building your plan is how am I distributing my product? There's all kinds of different ways to do that. It can be a competitive weapon. Um, again, I'll go back to the Dell example where you had an industry that was entirely partner-based. Companies made computers and then they relied on partners to distribute those products. A new guy came in and said, holy cow, I can do this myself, do it entirely direct, either decide to make more money or price my product lower because I have a lower cost of delivering that product to the consumer. Dow came in and said, I'm, I'm comfortable to make the same profit margin as my competitors or less, but I'm able to sell my product at a lower price because I've chosen a distribution model that has a lower cost. It's harder to do potentially if you don't know what you're doing, but if you know how to do it, I can potentially price my product lower. So it can be a competitive differentiator um, in the decision. 
is your distribution model at the end of the day. Any questions? Okay, I'm almost done, and then maybe we'll just open this up for questions. I feel like I feel like you're an unsatisfied group who's not getting what they need. Um, all right, let's go to the next one. Okay, um, do you guys want to talk about advertising at all? Is that important to you guys as part of your your pitches? Is this thing that's something that you need to worry about? Is how are you actually going to communicate your your business at the end of the day on losing more people? It's hurtful. It's hurtful. Do you want to talk about this? Is this worthwhile? Yeah. All right. So, um, I, again, I'm going to go through some concepts, and whether these things are things you need, I don't know. I don't know. You'll have to decide for yourself. But these are things that, as a guy who worked on a um, uh, hundred million dollar advertising budget, um, th this is what I cared about doing well. So, um, when you're starting down the, the the communications journey, these are some things you think you have to think about. So, again, as part of your pitches, I don't know if you need to say, "Here's exactly how I'm going to advertise my service or product." If you do. These are some of the things that you should be thinking about. So number one is objectives. Objectives are so important in the business world to be super precise on. And um, we, we generally divide them up into two forms, a business objective and a communication objective. The business objective of an advertising campaign generally is revenue-based or EBITDA-based or product sales-based. It's, it's generally a very simple idea. Um, so what's the business result I want when I go and advertise? The communication objective is, is what do I, what's, the, what's the shift, I, what do I need to make the consumer do or think? And they're different things. And sometimes comp companies, if they don't properly define the communication objective, if you don't really think about it, you might end up doing the wrong thing. So what I mean by a communication objective is, um, do I just want to build awareness? Do I just want somebody to know something exists? Do I actually want somebody to go and do a specific thing? Do I want them to go to my website and look on a specific page? Do I want them to go into a store and buy something? Do I want to shift the perception of what maybe they already think about me and it's wrong, so I want to fix it? All those things drive back to business objectives. If there's, an, if there's a misperception about a company and I do an ad campaign to fix a, business, a, a perception, that may get them to go into a store and buy a product. I don't necessarily have to say, save $20 if you go into a store today to buy this. I may say, my product actually is brighter and shinier than you thought it did. And that may, that may deliver on the business objective. So you gotta think about, what am I trying to communicate? What, what is the thing I want the consumer to do? What's the action I want them to take or what's the shift in what they think I want? If, you should try and define that as clearly as you possibly can because if you do that, it starts to refine the communication tactics that you choose. In other words, if my idea is that I need to shift brand, I need to shift a perception, you're gonna probably do different marketing tactics than if I need to tell some to, to get somebody to go to a website to check out um, a specific feature of a product. You're gonna use a very different set of communication tactics if that's what your communication objective is at the end of the day. So um, objective setting is very important. Would you mind just flipping ahead to the next one? Okay, um, another ingredient is what is your message in your campaign? I find so many people are so bad at this. The desire to communicate so many things overwhelms when the power in great advertising comes from being able to distill something down into a very singular, crisp, thought and what I call a key message. What is the key message of that ad campaign or that marketing communication campaign? Um, so the ingredients of a great key message, it needs to be singular, a single thought. You're going to use as many different distribution points and communication points as you possibly can. Consumers at the end of the day or your target at the end of the day is really not that interested in hearing from you. Um, depending again on what you're selling or what your offering is. So in order for you to just get a little wedge of brain space, you want to be as singular and as simple and as powerful as possible and be as repetitive as you possibly can. Um, ideally, you want to focus on the benefit to the consumer. You don't want to focus on the benefit to you. You don't want to be too functional if you, if you can avoid it. What is the benefit to the consumer? Um, 
And then if you can do that, it, um, what you'll find or what you need to think about is, as you're thinking about your communication tactics, can I, can I make that message work everywhere? So singular, singular thought, do I have the consumer benefit in mind? And then does it work well across the tactics I'm going to choose? Okay, those are just some of the ingredients in terms of um, coming up with your mix. So, so what, what do the mix include? Um, you know, you've got your you got your traditional advertising, TV, radio, out of home, digital. Um, it's very expensive. There's a couple of benefits to it. Um, it can get you very fast awareness. It can it can it's it's a very easy tool to build rapid awareness or to shift brand perception. The trick is it's extremely expensive. Really, really, really expensive. Um, uh, PR, PR generally on its own is never a strategy. It's always a good complement to a communications mix. Um, and PR is a combination of, of uh, today anyways, it, it's, a, it's, it's a bit of traditional, it's more about um, reaching influencer communities. And those influencer communities tend to be online. So a PR strategy generally involves who in my specific industry is a, is a voice that other people listen to for information or impartial views um, and, and outreaching to them and trying to, to influence them and get them to, to, to speak positively on your behalf. Um, social as a medium is very tricky. Um, my experience is it's, it's, it's a medium that you absolutely will need to be in, but it generally works better post-sale as a customer service and a customer engagement tool as opposed to an acquisition tool. Um, if you go into um, a communication campaign thinking I'm, I'm going to use social as my way to communicate, and a lot of people do that because it's generally viewed as very inexpensive or free, um, the success of it actually delivering on your communication objective is at high risk, at high risk. It can be like PR, a nice compliment, and again, very effective um, after the fact, but to use it as your sole thrust into the marketplace to try and build awareness for a product or build awareness for a service, um, you're at high risk. Um, sponsorship can be incredibly powerful. Um, and what I mean by sponsorship is attaching your brand or your product to an existing, more established brand or product that you think either aligns with that target and, 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 and the brand identity of that attached product you want it to halo over top of yours. So um, why do people sponsor the Toronto Maple Leafs? Um, they sponsor the Toronto Maple Leafs because there's, there's a positive brand halo that spills over onto your product or brand by the attachment of that, of that association and that sponsorship. It's a really, really powerful tool. However, to do it well, you have to activate it properly. Just putting a Toronto Maple Leafs logo on your product and saying, proud supporter of, which so many companies do is a complete is a large waste of time. For people who are fans of that of that team, and again I'm using that example. Um, for people who are fans of that team, how do you expose your brand and that message and that brand idea to that community? That's the trick inside sponsorship. Um, and then channel it. If if your if your if your business or your product at the end of the day, your distribution model is going to use. Uh, some kind of channel model where you're going to have some kind of partners that are going to be helping you build that scale and distribute. What's their role in helping you extend your communication reach? What's their reach out to the customer, and how do you and how do you make that happen? And I, and in my experience, is that's it's it's generally a, a poorly executed um, component. So, how do you decide on all these things? How do you pick it? How do you decide I'm going to do one or the other or all of them or what the investment level is? And ultimately, it, it all goes back to that brand strategy, that communication strategy, the communication objective. Um, it helps define it. So, um, if if my objective, if my communication objective is is to help people understand that um, I've got more hockey on my network than the other guy does, like if that's my communication objective at the end of the day, because I think if I can make that perception happen, then people are going to choose me for a whole bunch of other things, then I'm probably going to use very traditional media to do that. I'm going to do probably a big, boring, 
hopefully highly emotive TV commercial, as, uh, as, as old and boring as that sounds. If, if my objective is I want to get, um, I want to get a whole bunch of people to subscribe to my Sportsnet World channel that I've actually moved into an over-the-top online service that you can buy as just an online service and you don't even need to be a subscriber to television, I'm not going to do a big TV ad campaign because my target is so niche. I'm going after this person who loves soccer but also wants to watch soccer only on a, on a, on a laptop. Okay, well, I'm probably going to use purely digital means to go do that. Um, so again, it, it, the ingredient mix really depends, again, on, uh, on what your product is and, uh, and what your communication objective is. That may be my last slide. So um, I don't know if I've covered the things you need me to cover. It was a bit tricky coming in here because it, fe it feels like I'm just kind of barfing some stuff that's, that's marketing related. Um, and I know your, your individual situations are so unique. So why don't we do this? Um, let's, just, let's just talk and ask questions. And I may or may not be equipped to answer them based on my own experiences, but uh, I'm happy. Um, I would say uh, for, larger, for larger organizations, um, the marketing organization needs to be inside the business. Um, and that's because most marketing organizations are, are so tightly linked to the business strategy um, and, and, and ensuring that that business strategy, that brand strategy is, is being adhered to across the company is generally influencing product development. It's, it's influencing so many things. When it comes to marketing communications or advertising, um, uh, the, the tendency is to outsource um, parts of it um, because there's there's some there's some expertise and some specialization that it just doesn't make sense to, to develop in house. So um, for for a guy like me, if I'm developing a big advertising campaign, um, I'm going to go out and I'm going to hire an advertising agency to do the creative ideation, the production around that. I'm going to hire a media agency to go and determine the best mix of those media variables to, to develop my media plan and connect those things together. Um, as, uh, uh, for smaller companies, it almost even becomes more important because the, the, the chances that you've got that expertise in-house are almost nil. So I'd say when it comes to marketing, communications, PR, those kinds of things, most companies outsource it um, because the expertise just doesn't exist inside the company. It doesn't need to either. Um, so yeah, I'd say that's, that's generally the behavior. Yeah. I must have more questions. Is marketing even a big part of your pitch? Or is it kind of like a little ingredient? OK. You're just dominating the room, man. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, there. again, it's a. Uh, so I use Rogers as an example. Rogers would use uh, a very large, established, highly reputable, and, and, and highly expensive advertising agency to work on its business because um, it doesn't want any risk. It wants the best ideas, the best talent working on it. There are all kinds of, of communications and PR companies that specialize on working with small businesses um, because um, they tend to be smaller businesses, and they don't need they, they don't they don't necessarily so on a Rogers account um, You would have probably 80 people working on that business. You need a relatively large firm to do that, but um, When I was at Da Vinci very small company um, our products were uh, uh, Software installations and our, and our customers were the biggest telcos in Canada our, to get a customer would mean a, a five million dollar sale largely service-based um, I hired a, a, an agency to do our brand work, creative development, and they probably had three employees. I mean, they were, they were a little tiny, small consultancy of people who had come out of larger agencies. Um, so there absolutely are um, all kinds of companies out there that service businesses of all kinds of different sizes. And, and my, my marketing strategy inside Da Vinci, um, my, my target was not the end consumer. My target was the IT manager inside of Bell and the IT manager inside of Rogers. 
So our, my job was all about helping the sales organization make our company look way bigger than we actually were. It was about presentation, it was about materials, it was about um, helping open the door to um, get in, get in um, and meet with these people. It meant going to industry events, getting our leaders, speaking opportunities to make them visible. Um, very different set of tactics and techniques than a company like Rogers who's selling a, a cell phone to a teenager. But there's absolutely companies out there to service any, any size business, for sure. Yeah. What else? What other questions do you guys have? Somebody give me an example of what you're doing. Is it like secret? Is it like top secret? You don't want anybody else to know? Yeah. I mean, getting, getting basic demographic information is really easy. Um, and, uh, and, and generally, you can get that off of, uh, off of government websites. That there's, there's incredible statistical information that exists out there as part of the open public record um, that can help you get some, some really detailed um, demographic information. Um, when you want to get into psychographic information, so what, what does your target customer think, um, that's generally where you're going to have to do some proprietary work. And there's a lot of companies out there who, who specialize in that kind of thing. And there's different techniques, in and there's all kinds of different techniques in terms of how you go get those answers. And you can spend a lot of money or not a lot of money. Um, <clears throat> uh, so, um, yeah, from, from, a, from, a, from, a, from a psychographic perspective, you're, you're, you're going to need to employ an agency who's going to help you get inside the mind of the target. The same thing, like, the same thing is more about uh, the uh, images of what they perceive as good yep. or what they perceive as spending. Yep. All of that is not good, at least in the broader case, and it's not Yeah. Important. Yeah, we, were, we, we, we hired multiple companies, and, and, and at the end of the day, you need to get in front of that target. You need to bring that target and you need to talk to that target. You need to, to try and understand them and have it and have them express it. There's different ways you can do it. I mean, from the very basic focus group technique where you get eight people around a room and you ask them a bunch of questions to um, we did some crazy things where we literally um, had people live with youth, like literally shadow them over the course of a week. They didn't, they didn't stay in their bedroom when they were sleeping, but outside of that, they literally shadowed them for weeks, tracked the, went to classes with them, hung out at bars with them, and went home with them, hung out with their friends with them. Because um, sometimes when you ask people things, they tell you what you think you want to hear. But when you just observe, it's like, it's like going into the wild and studying tigers. Um, we actually did the same thing with, with real people. Um, so there's, there's different ways of doing it, some more authentic and some are risky because you get, sometimes they can steer you wrong if they're not done properly. In my experience, it's always been a few, Focus groups are the worst because if you sit down and, and ask a bunch of people questions, um, all they want to do is sound smart. They don't actually tell you what, what you what you should hear. They just tell you what you think you want to hear and makes them sound clever in the room. But yeah, there's tons of companies out there that uh, that can help you do that. Because if you don't know, um, let's just let's just say hypothetically, your, your, your business is, has the potential to be scalable, large, and generate a lot of revenue. Spending fifty thousand dollars to really understand your target well—that's going to help you position your product well. It's nothing. It's nothing at the end of the day. I mean, in my Rogers life, um, I said I spent a hundred million dollars a year on advertising. Um, I spent a million dollars a year understanding how effective that advertising was. Some people looked at me like I was insane. I spent a million dollars a year just understanding the effectiveness of my advertising. It's like. Okay, if my advertising is 50% ineffective, I just wasted $50 million. So 
at the end of the day, in the grand scheme of things, understanding your target, understanding your insights, understanding what motivates them um, to, to buy your product is some of the best money you can spend. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That sounds great. Yep. So I'm just wondering whether it's better to focus on the convenience of the customer, like is it a convenient way to get food, or, or how, how to work your cause, like how much to bring the cause into their communications? Right. So, uh, um, you got to go back to that insight. What, what, what at the core motivates them the most? Because those are two great options. Try not to do both. Try not to do both because they're both powerful and they're both so different from each other in terms of what they are. Um, so I can't answer the question for you. You could you could try and ask people and, and try and get a sense of it. I mean, you could do it very inexpensively. You could you just go talk to people. Well, go to the mall and stop 15 people and ask them the question. Um, you'd be surprised what you get back. You can do it very inexpensively, but but my advice would be to pick one. Make the choice of which one you think is the most powerful at the end of the day and make it make as much of your communication about that one thing. Maybe your website talks about multiple things and um, that, that's okay. But if you're out there at the end of the day pushing a message to, go, to get your product, if you can make it singular, because generally your idea is gonna be built around that one thing. If you have a good creative idea, you can't do it on two completely different things that have two completely different benefits to the consumer. Your creative idea is gonna be it's not going to be a creative idea. It's going to be a terrible idea. Um, that's a great question. Those are, and that, that, that's, the, that's, the, that's the exact example where you've got two powerful benefits, but they're so different from each other. And if you try and do it both, it's going to be, it's going to be hard. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's a long answer. I'm gonna. So um, this is so hard in a startup mode. I, I, I have a great answer for an established business. Um, so. <clears throat> so for. Uh, for Rogers, Rogers has implicitly accurate information that says if I spend this much money against this target, I will get this many people to go into a store. Provided I, I have a nice tight key message and I execute my creative well and my media strategy is pretty good. If I spend this much money, I'll get this many people into a store. I know my average transaction rate of success is X percent. I'm going to drive that many sales. So the performance indicators for a company like Rogers is is sales and traffic. I mean, that, that as basic as that sounds, it's that, that's the key performance indicators. For a guy like me who, who worked on the advertising, um, I did very deep, like I said, I spent a million dollars a year on understanding if my advertising worked. Um, the things I wanted to understand were, were very fundamental things about the performance of the advertising. So uh, concepts like, did you see my ad? Uh, did you know what I was trying to tell you in that ad? Um, this is going to make you laugh, but it's real. Did you know it was my company that was advertising it? You didn't misattribute it to some other brand. Um, and the fourth and most important thing was, did it motivate you to go do something? Did it make you want to go and learn more? So I, I implicitly tracked awareness, uh, brand link, which was, did you know it was my company? Message comprehension, did you know what the heck I was trying to say in my ad? And, uh, and, uh, and did it motivate you to go act? Those are the ways I measured the effectiveness. And I knew that if I drove certain levels of all of those things, my campaign would be successful. So I knew if I drove 50% awareness against my target, I'm happy. I knew if I drove 50% of those people had proper, or 80% of those people had proper attribution, I'm happy. If I knew that 50% of those people understood what my message was, I was happy. And I knew if a quarter of those people did something, I was happy. And if any of those things were off, 
I had the potential to screw up that store traffic. That's, that's one of the ways that we would measure the effectiveness of advertising. Um, for me today, in Sportsnet, one of the things I need to do is I need to get people to tune in and watch a show. Um, my only metric is that audience. Did I get that audience to tune in or not? Um, and for me, it's a, it's a matter of experimentation. So I can try different spend levels, I can try different media mix, and I can do that regionally in different ways to figure out what's the best and optimal way to try and drive that audience target. So if I've got to get a million, if I want to get a million people to tune into the Blue Jays and a game, I figure out, okay, well, do I need to spend $10 million doing that or do I need to spend $50 million doing that? And the only way to get to the right answer is you've got to model, experiment, and measure. You can never get it right out of the gate. I mean, back to your original question, what's the right answer? You never know. So you have to make some assumptions and then you've got to put it into practice and then you gotta put measurement in place to make sure you understand how it's doing, and then you just have to continually optimize and refine. That's the only way to do it. You'll never get it right right out of the gate. It's impossible. Okay, does that, that help? Okay. Any energy left? What is it? Six o'clock on a Friday. Yeah. How many of you guys get Oh yeah, oh yeah. Um, my my honest answer is um, uh, they bought into what the vision of the new Sportsnet is going to be, and um, they saw it as a much more exciting place to be for the long term uh, opportunity for their career in terms of expanding their own personal profile, their own reputation, their own celebrity, um, will only grow by coming and being part of our business because we, we basically sold them on where we're going. Um, and lo and behold, we bought the score. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, so Sportsnet now owns the score. We'll take control in uh, the next couple of months, and the score will stop being the score. The score will start being Sportsnet. Yeah. And you may see Tim and Sid again. <laughs> no, no, no. no. <clears throat> uh, I don't know that. I don't know the answer to that question. <clears throat> yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. If there's anything else you guys want, just uh, hopefully you'll have my contact information. Fire me an email. Um, look me up on LinkedIn. Um, my Twitter following is not that big, but if you want to connect me on Twitter, that's fine too. I can send my contact information out, but feel free to find me an email. We'll get you this, this information, whatever you guys need, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I do, yeah. Good. Thanks, everybody.